I got quite close to thinking, oh, this isn't fun anymore. These, the demons are so loud in my head. I don't want to do theatre again if this is what it's going to feel like. And then I got Doctor Who, which is a different level of public recognition. And you don't get taught how it will feel not being able to walk into a room anonymously is, it's like your skin's been flayed off. Very vulnerable. Without Billy there, if I'd been doing it absolutely kind of on my own, I think I'd have struggled even more than I did. David. Hi. How are you? <laughs> I'm all right. I'm fine, I think. Yeah. There aren't many Davids out there these days. Lots of Daves, not many Davids. Such... It used to, when I, I was at school, my, my original name is David McDonald. Yeah. I was at school with another David McDonald. I mean, I was good with about 1,500 Davids. Somebody who had my actual same name in the same year group. How irritating. How irritating. But it used to be such a ubiquitous name. And but now it was Dave. you cannot find them. I like that you've just stuck with Dave. Does I've anyone never call you Dave? Dave? No my one. dad used to call me Dave. Really? And every now and again, you'll come across someone who just reverts to Dave absolutely instinctively. Mm. It's but a bit it's, bold, isn't it? It is a bit bold, yeah. Just going with Dave. Yeah. Uh, I, but but it's never. I've never been a Dave. That's like once I, oh, I bumped into Jason Donovan and I called him Jace. Did you <laughs> don't know him well enough to do that. And then I walked away mortified. He's got a slight. He's got yeah, a kind of loosey goosey quality though, hasn't he? I, I bet he line. loved it. Uh, do you I don't think you step. I mean, I know you know. I don't know Jason well, mm. but I he. Whenever I meet him, he's so charming. He's so. Open He's and so friendly. Lovely. Yeah. I can only imagine. He sort of is a Jace. Jace. Oh, it still makes me feel a bit sick when I think about <laughs> it. Um, so I got a sneaky peek at the first episode of The Rivals. Did you know? Uh, it, this is this could not be any more up my street if it tried. <laughs> I loved it <laughs> so much. I can't wait to watch episode two. Yeah. It's so fun. The 80s soundtrack is incredible. The soundtrack is sensational. It's set in 1986. It's, of course, a Dame Julie Cooper novel. Yes. And it's just the fashion and the music is absolute peak. I'm a, I know that they spent a large chunk of their considerable budget on a lot of really banging tracks. It's so it good. Really, it really counts when you watch it, doesn't it? Oh, massively. I think it just takes you back to that decade. And I yeah. was I was a kid in the 80s, so it just it was like a visceral reaction to watching yeah. it. But I just loved it. It's so much fun. Brilliant, brilliant storyline. Amazing cast. Brilliant characters. For you these days, what does a project or a character have to have for you to say yes? Uh, well, this one very particularly was my wife. That's what made me say yes to this one. <laughs> because she knew the book. I think she'd read a bit of Jilly Cooper as a, not as a child, but as a younger woman, or as uh, maybe as a sort of adolescent woman, particularly. I think there was a, I mean, they're quite titillating. Yeah. Um, and there's a bit of a sort of rites of passage, perhaps, for for people of a certain generation. I'm sure it still happens now, actually. You discover these books on your mum's shelf. And Jackie Collins. And Jackie one. Collins, yeah, yeah. Read them and all. They're a little bit, a little bit saucy, a yeah, little bit rude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also they have great characters and great stories uh, and they and they kind of, they reel you in, I think. So she knew the book anyway. And I read the script and I was about, it was like nothing I'd really read before. It was, it tonally, I didn't quite get it. I couldn't quite imagine what it would be. And sometimes I, you know, Georgia will say, well, what's that script like? And, and I, sometimes I'll go, I, would, I, will you have a look? Because I'm not, I don't, not sure that I quite get it. And she read this and went, you've got, you are doing this. There is absolutely no debate about it. I went, really? I was, I didn't think it was quite mean. She went, no, there is no question. There is no debate. You're going to do this. It's the most fun, most exciting, most brilliant thing I've read. Well, the great thing, I guess, about Julie Cooper is, like you've said, the storylines are impeccable. There's yeah. so much drama and fun. And they're hilarious without trying yeah. too hard. There are yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of humour in her books. I think they're quite... What's interesting about this, of course, is, you know, Jilly is still very much with us. She's very, yeah, yeah, she's yeah. very vibrant and dynamic. Was she on set with you? Oh, yeah. All oh, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she makes an appearance in a later episode. Does she? Yeah. Uh, I would not give it away, but it's very, it's a very fun little cameo. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, so, but she, you know, she's, she's, but she's a lady of a certain age now. So she wrote this in the mid-1980s, which means this is now a period piece. Oh, you can't say that. 
it's a period piece. Is it really? Are we at that age where our <laughs> actual lives is. are a period it piece? It absolutely is. And, and the act of filming it is, you know, you're, you're having to watch every frame has to be checked for accuracy, for yeah. historical accuracy. Wow. You're getting every vehicle has to be supplied by a specialist company, all the clothes, all that stuff. Because the 80s are quite a long time ago now. Yeah, but in my head, they're like two years ago. It's terrifying. It's because you're, you're not, none of us are quite as young as you think we are. <laughs> this is the problem. It's terrifying. And because I, I, you know, I was a, uh, I was born in seventy one, so I was a teenager in the eighties. Mm. That still feels relatively recent to me. <laughs> and there were lots of things that during the filming of it, you can go, I recognise that, I remember this. And then now and again, like, there's a point where they, there was a, an ambulance on set, and it was a genuine eighties ambulance. It looked like something from the war. Wow. At that moments of that, you were, you realised, oh, this is. It's 40 years ago. Yeah. It's not recent anymore. I, I love that element of watching it back. There was some footage where I'm thinking, was it real footage? It was like a bit of um, sort of street footage. And I was like, that looked like genuine 80s footage. I don't know if it was or not. I don't think there is any genuine footage in it. I mean, there's things like so gen well the done. genuine Concorde, because Concorde yeah, exists yeah, yeah. in a museum, and they let us go in and film on it. Really? So we're in the actual Concorde for the scene in Concorde. That's so cool. Which is great. It was quite pokey, it turns yeah. out. Yeah. Were you ever on it in real life? God, no. No. No, no. Me neither. My wife was, of course. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> she was tiny at the time. Oh, but, I, I um, remember them flying overhead. You'd all run outside into the garden yeah. and, and hear the look sonic up and boom. Hear. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, well, it's brilliant. I, I absolutely loved loved watching episode one. You play Lord Tony Baddingham. Tell us about <laughs> Lord Tony Baddingham. Lord, Lord Tony Baddingham. He's, uh, he's, in some ways, I suppose he's the villain of the piece. Not that he sees it that way. But he is, uh, I mean, that none of them are, uh, they're sort of all villains in a way. They're all monstrous individuals. He uh, owns a television station, Corinium Television. This is back in the days when ITV wasn't one uh, homogenous thing. It was split into regional television stations, which all fed into the main ITV. So you had London Weekend Television, you had... Uh, Granada in North of England, you had Tyne Tees, you had Anglia. So it's a fictional version of one of them. And there used to be a great competition for these franchise rights. And, and uh, this sort of takes place over franchise renewal time. So Tony Baddingham is the... Uh, he, is he crooked? Probably a little bit. Yeah. He's certainly... Uh, he, he runs this station for... Um, well, I don't know that he's interested in the art, mm. but he's certainly interested in the power. He's certainly interested in the status that it gives him. And his main competitor in life and as the series goes on in, in television is Rupert Campbell Black, who is this sort of superstar MP. He's a kind of, I mean, we do not have an equivalent these days. He's a sort of sexy, roguish awful but all everyone wants to be him the men yeah. want to be him the women want to be with him that kind of a character played by Alex Hassel with great swagger and charm um, you know he sort of takes his shirt off and everyone everyone melts he's that kind of a character and Tony doesn't have that natural charm neither does Tony have and of course in the world of a Jilly Cooper novel this is very important neither does Tony have the class Tony's from a grammar school he didn't go to school he didn't go to uh, he doesn't have that uh, that uh, the blue blood in his veins, yeah, and that in Tony's world, uh, it's it's very painful to him. Yeah, and something didn't... that he can never, he so he can never quite be at the top table, and that's something that he spent his life trying to rectify. Yeah, you can sense that insecurity in him, yeah. which is usually the driving force for most bad behaviour. Yes, is insecurity yes. in people, and I quite. loved sensing that in him. The cast, as you've mentioned, is incredible. Yeah. You've just got so many great people in, in this cast. Danny Dyer. Um, Danny's you've got, brilliant. You've got Aidan Turner, Aiden Nefessa Fr Williams. Yeah. I mean, it's it's an all-star cast. What's the difference between working with a TV cast to a theatre cast? Because I'm imagining there is more close-knit in theatre because you are all sort of lumped together. Did you Do you get that sort of sense that there's a, a difference between the two? Sometimes you do. It sort of depends... Uh, obviously, yeah, with, you're right with the theatre show, you all turn up every night at the theatre and you're all there together. And you, Even if you're not in scenes with people, you are backstage with them. You're part of this little group. Uh, or, or, or when you're filming something, it's not necessarily the case because you only turn up for the scenes you're in, yeah. obviously. So there'll be some t there'll be some jobs, you'll ne there, there'll, there'll be other characters you never meet and you can sometimes meet them at the press launch for the first time. This was, 
a bit of an amalgam in a way because it's 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 quite a tight ensemble. Kath. There's a lot of characters, but we're all in it a lot with each other. So there was a there was a real sense of camaraderie about it. It's a really joyous bunch of people. Partly by chance, partly because I I know that the producers sort of set out. They did a lot of due diligence, checking people out. Um, uh, uh, producers and directors always say that oh no, we're only going to assemble nice people. It was genuinely true on this, and there was a lot of checking people out, phoning people up. You worked for this person once before. God, uh, that's good. Yeah, they did a lot of that, and it really, really shows. I did not know that that sort of thing happened. You just I think assume it happens it's... more and wow. more. I think. I think. I think people are a bit fed up of bad behaviour. God, yeah. Well, it's just n- not There's not acceptable. really any excuse for it. There's no excuse for it. And also, I think you watch a show like The Rivals and you can sense that joy that yeah. everyone's getting on and there's a bit of mischief amongst the cast. You can sort yeah. of feel that and you can't buy that stuff. It's got to be genuine. Yeah. And it was a genuinely joyous experience. How brilliant. It could, it could have been awful, I suppose. You know, if, if there'd been a few personalities yeah. that jarred. Or, uh, 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 and not many of us knew each other. I mean, some people had crossed paths with people before there was a couple of people who maybe worked together a couple of times i'd worked with claire rushbrook once before but i didn't know her well you know but i it just so happened that it was a group of people who just sort of fell in love with each other so it was good it made what could have been a long difficult job into something that was utterly joyful how brilliant i mean your career has been unbelievably diverse you have done every end of the spectrum from yeah. the rivals to playing macbeth on yeah. stage what do you get from theater that you don't get in tv doing a very serious shakespearean play it's a very different flavor and tone to doing something like the rivals or doctor who what do you get from theater you can't get in telly i suppose it's just a different it's quite a different job yeah i mean it's they're all pretending to be somebody else uh, but beyond that, a sort of live theatre show is a very intense couple of hours every evening where you're trying as a group to kind of create this thing that you suspend in front of an audience and, and you, you, you have to create this bubble of reality which which lasts for a very specific, very heightened period of time. Whereas filming is all a, is a completely different pace. You're, you're, you do a take which lasts 30 seconds and then you'll stand around for... 5, 10, 15 minutes, half an hour. They move lights around, you do it again. But it, it, it's just got a very different... It's just a completely different situation, actually. Um, uh, and uh, it, they, they have very different paces, very different rhythms. Um, and I love that I get to do both. I very much enjoy the, the variety of that and the, the way that it one complements the other, I think. Yeah, I can imagine. And theatre is such a a crazy discipline. Not only is there remembering just swathes of script. I don't know how... I mean, do you have a technique to do that? To get those words in your head? No. No, that's just... There's no magic trick. It's just the boring bit. It's just boring. It's just boring. Yeah. Yeah. And people keep saying, how do you learn your lines? Because I think people want there to be a skill to learning what to do. Because it would be very useful. Yeah. if, if, If... photographic memories were real things especially with Shakespearean text because that's not something that you could off the cuff ad lib if you go off on a no. tangent by mistake you've no. got to stick verbatim to this stuff. yeah you so there's do. extra pressure a little bit yes a little bit that's true but the the rhythm of it can sort of help as well as it's in this iambic pentameter yeah. and you, you can kind of you can be aware that there's sort of two beats there that's sometimes you'll find yourself slightly losing a specific word and inserting another one that, right. that rhythmically works. And you can get away with quite a lot that way, actually. Not a new fandangled word, though. It's got to be something... Uh, I mean, if it if it sounds convincing <laughs> and you can do it without missing a beat... Or maybe if you roll an R oh, while yeah. saying it, then yeah. anything is passable as old, yeah. isn't well. it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds archaic. It sounds very archaic. Um, I can imagine that you've done many Shakespeare plays now, that they are very nerve-wracking hmm. to execute. Just before you're about to start, do the first run or maybe even the press night, yeah. what are the nerves like? It does vary show to show. And uh, you can't always tell which are going to be the more terrifying ones. But it is absolutely bum-clenching, yeah. Oh, yeah, I bet. Yeah, especially that first time you do it. Mm. Um, and some performances that gets easier, some it doesn't. 
But I don't know that Shakespeare is necessarily more nerve wracking than something else. I think it depends on the circumstance. I did a play a couple of years ago called Good, which was a r relatively modern play um, about the the rise of Nazi the, the Nazis in Germany in the thirties. Um, and it was ju there was only three of us in it, three of us who played a selection of characters, and and we were on this tiny little stage, and we had to come through a bit in the back wall that they then closed behind us and every night we heard it locking <laughs> oh god <laughs> so we, we'd come on stage and the lights would go down we, the curtain was in front of us the the wall was behind us and you hear it go clunk no going back and the three of us were uh, we knew we just had each other for whatever it, however long it was that's the most terrified ever i've ever been in any play and it never got easier we, we did 12 weeks and the three of us were absolute wrung out dish rags by the end of that does it Border on anxiety. Oh my borders! It's right there. Oh right, yeah. yeah. It's right there, and at its worst, you're in the middle of a performance, and you're composing the speech you're about to make to the audience about how you have to stop and that th that you can't go on because it's the fear that your brain will just give up. Yeah. That your brain will just go because it it feels so intangible, doesn't it? It feels ephemeral. You, yeah. The, you can't you can't hold a piece of paper that that means you know what comes next you just have to trust memory which is such a nebulous thing to grab hold mm. of that if you think about that too much oh it starts to become a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy yeah if i think about even driving too much my feet go yeah wait what what foot's pressing what pedal hit? yeah like you yeah you have to almost not think you have to trust the instinct How, after yeah it's yeah. almost a meditative state that you must get yes, in absolutely and a lot of it is to do with managing that anxiety yeah. and, just... and how do you manage that anxiety well it, it i don't really have a single answer to that and sometimes i feel like i don't and that, that play good, which I loved and I'm so proud of. I'm so glad we did. It was a, it's a brilliant piece of writing. And it was a r great production with two other actors who I just think are brilliant. So I'm, I look back in it very proudly. But the act of going through it was pretty miserable, actually, mm. at times. Because it was every night I thought, I, I'm going to be in a state of such anxiety every night. And Macbeth, funnily enough, which was the play I've done most recently and we're, we're about to do again, wasn't like that. Wow. Um, I mean, it, I'm not saying it was without anxiety because it absolutely was, and that's part of you want to you want enough. Yeah. Because it keeps you on your metal. Um, and it and it you know it wakens you up and it and it, it it can it can actually be quite inspiring sometimes and quite creative that level of anxiety, it, but just enough. Yeah. You don't want to, you don't want to be spending your whole time dealing with your own demons because that doesn't feel very productive after a certain point no and for some reason that show didn't feel like the one before it, there's no rhyme or reason no I think it's also partly where you are in your own life yeah um, it's partly what that particular production means to you um, whether it feels whether you feel on top of it or it feels on top of you and that again is a quite a difficult thing to to navigate or to second guess um, and it doesn't always make sense. No. I mean, I've thought about this a lot because I've absolutely had those moments where I'm, like you say, writing this speech in my head of what I'm going to say in the middle of presenting something mm. or hosting something on stage, and you feel like, oh, God, I my, body's, my, my soul's leaving my body slightly here. I need to explain what's yeah. going on or yeah. why I've stopped or whatever, and I haven't luckily ever got to that point, but I've been bloody close. Yeah. And I think I've then gone into a bit of self-analysis as to what is the fear? What am I actually scared of? Is it being judged by other people? Is it being seen as a failure? Yeah. Is it not reaching my own potential? What is that fear? I don't know if I've landed on it personally. Yeah. I wonder if you've thought about that. I think, well, certainly in terms of being doing a play, I think because it is that slightly nebulous thing, of trusting memory, which you can't really, I mean, you can't sort of take your brain apart and have a look at it like an engine and trust that it's all working. Mm. You just have to rely on the fact that, well, it's worked before. I, I hope it will still work now. One day it might not. I think that's the thing. And that, that you'll, that you'll self-sabotage so much that you'll somehow mess up. I'll say mess up. Am I allowed to say anything? What's you the can swearing? use all the swears. You can use all the swears. Yeah, no rules. Yeah, the the idea that you might fuck up, and that that will feel sort of game changing, and that once you've 
gone there, you can never quite come back to a place of any kind of safety where you rely on yourself enough. Yeah. I think I think it's that. And interestingly, with that other play I was talking about when I was doing good, I, I got quite close to thinking, oh, this isn't fun anymore. These The demons are so loud in my head that I don't want to do the do theatre again if this is what it's going to feel like. That's so interesting because the reaction would undoubtedly be from any audience, certainly for you, but I think for most people, um, total empathy and understanding because they would only see the humanness in you rather than, you know, you're a sort of yeah. performing machine. But of course, it's still extremely uncomfortable to go through. But also, because also that's your job. That's what yeah. you're there to do. Yeah. You don't want to... Um, you, there's a sort of sense that if I were ever to go there once, then I could go there again, and yeah. then therefore... I mean, it's a lot of risk involved, isn't there? Yeah, which of course is also part of why, partly why you're doing it. Yeah, there's a, an almost sort of tantalising addiction to feeling yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get that. And uh, it, it, the, uh, coming through the other end of it is exhilarating and wonderful. And when mm. I, you know, I, I, I look back on these experiences and I'm so glad I did it. Yeah. I'm so proud that I got through it. I'm so thrilled by the piece of work we achieved. Do you think it gets harder as one gets older? Well, I that's what I was beginning to... Again, this is what I was beginning to worry about, that maybe I've just... That there was the three of us on... And I don't mean to speak for them, but I think we were all pretty of a mind. Myself and Sharon Elliott that were in this this play with us, and the, we, we were all sort of of an age. We were all going, have we just, have we just gone over the top now? Have we peaked? <laughs> is it now just... Does it now just get worse and more difficult? I don't think it's about getting worse. I think that when we're younger, and you know, you started acting at a young age, I started in telly, telly very young, you are so wonderfully naive. Yeah. And that comes paired beautifully with this self-confidence because you're not worrying about the pitfalls. You're just mm. going, the sky is the limit. Mm. Let's see where this will take me. And I don't think I had any anxiety or panic or concern about my ability on camera for a good 15 years it mm. didn't cross my mind and it, I could have been absolutely awful some of the time but I didn't care mm. I think that naivety serves us so well when we're younger yeah. and as we get older and we start to get the knocks from life and at work that dilutes slightly and it's harder to grab hold of well certainly naivety has gone out the window but just that solid self-belief seems a bit more brittle would you yeah. say and you've got more to lose you got more to lose. You got more to lose personally. You have got more to lose professionally. Yeah. You've got, uh, uh, and it, 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 as you do sniff mortality, mm. you don't want to let it in. I suppose. Whereas no. when you're twenty, you're just going to live forever, aren't you? You're going to live forever, and, and everything's fine. Yeah. But then I think maybe the awareness of that helps all of us, whatever job you're in, to perform slightly better because you're not anywhere near complacency. And actually, the gratitude probably ramps up with the understanding that it's all quite fragile. Yeah. And there is definitely a... If you can get the balance right, so there's just enough yeah. fear yeah. to keep you sharp, that's exactly what you want. Because, like you say, you don't want to be rolling in complacently. No. And you don't want to be thinking this is easy, ever. No. Because then you stop striving and you stop... Get bored. ...working, yeah. But it's... But... but it, just keeping it tamed is the is the real task, I think. It is. It's really tricky. Mm. If you're having a time or a, about where you're lacking in confidence, what would you do to help yourself? Well, I don't know that I've got a good answer to that. I don't know that I've ever figured that out. I've just sort of gone through times when I have been feeling a bit more like that and kind of just pushed on until that recedes mm. maybe i've been lucky that it's never toppled over to the point where it absolutely paralyzed me if it has felt like it's come close now and again but i think i've always managed to just stay on the right side of pushing on through until the kind of the the, the ship turns enough for it for you to feel like oh i, I I'm, 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 a, I'm a bit more on top of it for a while which is a really interesting answer because it's giving yourself the time to sit in it. Yeah, I suppose, but uh, yeah, but only just because I don't really know how, 
know how else to do it. I, well, I think that's know. really cool because I think a lot of the time we are all searching for a quick fix or this one thing we know always works and then often we're let down because it doesn't. Yeah. And actually what you know we're all guilty of is not allowing ourselves to just feel the horrible feeling. We're like, I don't like this. What, what can I yeah. do to make it go away? Yeah. Whereas actually, a lot of the time, like you've just said, if you just sit in it for a bit and go, God, this doesn't feel great. And then the ship turns and you're out the other yeah. side. Yeah. And I suppose that's one of the advantages of getting older is that you recognise some of those feelings when they recur and you know that they're not necessarily uh, terminal. Yes. That you can, oh, I felt, I felt this panicked before. And it ended up being okay, yeah. or it didn't, and it certainly didn't kill me because I'm still here. Yeah. So I suppose there's a bit of that, you know, just that thinking, and that can certainly be in those talking about being on stage in those very extreme moments when your brain is shouting at you. You're going to have to stop <laughs> because you don't know what's next, and you're going to let everybody down. And it's about it's happening now. It's happening now. It's happening now. As this. It's at the end of this scene. When you get to the end of the scene, there's nothing else. I've got nothing. It's gone. It's over. And you start composing the <laughs> speech to the audience. And there's a that's happened enough now. Yeah. That on some level, even though I'm feeling all that panic and the rising horror, I can go, this isn't new. I have been here before. Yeah. And... And I was all right. Mm, I like, I like the. But it's not going to be all right this time. <laughs> I love the look into your brain. It's so, it's not dissimilar to mine. And I think you do go. Well, I certainly go. Oh, boring. Here we go again. Here it goes. Yeah, again. Yeah, if you can be bored by it, it's quite useful. Boring. Isn't it? You can sort of tame it that way. If oh, you, it's yeah. so boring. I get. But it, it is really boring. I mean, I get it in equal measures, not just in sort of extraordinary work situations because I think stuff like this now I just it's just pure enjoyment for me I right. love doing stuff like this I'm lucky enough that that voice in my head isn't that loud yeah but if I was to be placed on a TV show that I wasn't comfortable with oh god all the voices would be shouting in my head yeah but I equally get it in really mundane settings like you know uh, going out for dinner with people yeah. or at the school gates or bumping into someone in the street. It can be quite loud then. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's not just work stuff. It's like it pops up when you don't want it to. Yeah. So annoying. Yes. Oh, you're doing small talk now and you don't know how to keep it going. Yeah. Oh, you're going to have to. <laughs> this is going to stop and it's going to be on you to keep it going and you've got nothing. I hate small talk so oh much. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I, it's, I it, yes, it. being a normal human is really almost more weird. difficult. <laughs> it's it's so painful. Yeah. And that's boring. Yeah. I find myself asking the boring things that I don't want other people to ask me about, like, holidays and stuff. And I know. You just do but it. You, well, you've got to do a bit of that. You've got to you? do a bit of that. You've uh, got to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> it's really hard being oh, a human. Oh, God. Um, I'm really... Well, so one thing that I... When I was Googling you... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, good. <laughs> Oh, oh, good. oh, good. All of these facts will be real. <laughs> so I Googled that your first job was for an anti-smoking commercial that was shown oh, in was. schools and TV. Oh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. My oh, first acting job. Your first acting job. Which it, Was that my first actual paid thing? Probably was, actually, yeah. Because I was only 16, I think. That's incredible. I've never had a paper around or anything before that. That probably was my first actual job. Do you think the excitement of any other job has given you the satisfaction of getting that gig? That's interesting. Yeah, I think it probably has because I think, um, like the thing you were talking about earlier, the 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 the, the kind of idealism, the carefreeness of youth, meant it, I, it, I'm almost more thrilled now that I'm that people still want me to do things than I was then because then you just thought, well, well obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, this was going to happen yeah, at some point. Of <laughs> and it was only an anti-smoking firm for Glasgow City Council. Yeah, but it was. But it was. You're being paid. I was being paid, and there was Amazing. a camera pointing at me, and it was yeah, and it was an anti-smoking film for uh, a, a very. I think I was 15 when I did it. Maybe I was 16. I think I was 15. Uh, I was a very green 15-year-old who had never been near a cigarette. Mm. Who then perfect had to, candidate who had to play the bad boy smoker. Oh, you were the bad boy smoker. People. It's probably remains the worst acting I ever did because, but. <laughs> But cleverly, 
I managed to get through a whole day on set, and I think it was just a day, where I had to look like I was really tough and cool. Mm. I had a I had a brown no, I had a black denim jacket. Of course you did. Uh, and a green <laughs> '80s shirt, um, and I managed to wave the cigarette around, looking like I knew what I was doing with it, and never had to light it. Oh, that's good. Yeah, your and lungs remain intact. I don't know what that says about the director or that. <laughs> <laughs> it was that's so good. Yeah. I mean, not long after you were doing all sorts of incredible plays and joining the Royal Shakespeare Company, and well, I had drama school in between, and, and that drama, was that. Yeah. yeah, and that was a big big sort of change for me because I went from someone who didn't know anyone who did acting to being surrounded by people from all different walks of life and a lot of older people as well because people come to drama school often not necessarily as the first thing they do after school so you have a whole range of people with a whole range of experiences and and, and uh, 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 some have had already gone off and done things and so and I was so new I mean I'd done an anti-smoking film for Glasgow City Council <laughs> but other than that I was I was very sort of fresh faced to it all so that just being amongst people who wanted to do the same thing as me and in many cases had done so much more than I had done and had lived life more than I had done. That was a, that they were the most formative years for me, those three years of drama school. And do you think having known from a really young age that that's what you wanted to do, you were very focused yeah. on that being the dream, when you st- went to drama school or started with the Royal Shakespeare Company, was it as you had imagined it to be? I don't know that I knew what it was going to be, other than I knew I wanted to do it. Um, I mean, it certainly was just such a thrill that I managed to get there. Because with acting, with lots of things, you know, I suppose with, with a lot of the creative industries, they're very oversubscribed. Um, and I, I didn't know people who'd been actors, so I had no precedence for understanding how a career like that might work. I just decided I wanted to do it. And therefore, everyone around you went, well, that's not, you can't, you can't do that. And then statistics would come up, that, you know, only 5% of people who are registered as actors actually make a living at it. It's impossible to ever buy a house. It's impossible to, you, you, you know, the, the, the people that uh, are successful at it are are drops in the ocean of the people who want to do it so there was a lot of one was constantly being fed information that told you you weren't going to be able to do this so make sure you've also got like I, I ended up going to drama school and did a degree course which would also have allowed me to to convert to a teaching right. degree partly because I just kept being told that I wouldn't be able to make a living at it and that I needed to have a proper job somewhere on the horizon and I suppose I could always be a drama teacher. Did you have one of those um, career advising sessions at your school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember having one of those. Yeah. What did they suggest you do instead? I don't know that they had a suggestion. I remember they gave me some photocopied sheets that Mr Bowman, who was also the French teacher. Right. I mean, I don't know why that qualified him to do <laughs> careers, to, give to careers advice. To work out advice. your destiny. And basically what he seemed to do was go through a folder. I mean, we didn't have the internet in those days. Yeah. Go through a, a, a folder of photocopied sheets and go, oh, I think that says acting on it. Have that. Yeah. I think that was, only, that was it. I think that was the only one he'd ever handed out. <laughs> and it didn't really, I don't remember didn't it. chime. Particularly changing my life no. direction. <laughs> no. no. When, you, um, when you noticed that switch from okay, I'm a jobbing actor and it's all going pretty well here to I'm onto something. This is this is now a thing. This is not only a career, but I'm being recognised in the street and this is life-changing essentially because I think as soon as you put fame into the equation, something shifts and it's not necessarily something that you're striving for, but it's part and parcel if, if you're yeah. doing well. How did that sit with you? Because I think the strange thing certainly about the fame element especially when you're an actor. Like, for Mm. me, I'm a presenter formally, so it's my personality. But you can choose to have a very private life if you're an actor. But when fame comes into the equation, people then meet you with certain assumptions. Was there a time when you thought, oh, wait, they see me as this person. Does that match up with who I know I actually am? And there being a bit of a discord between the two. I think I did struggle a bit. Because, yeah, I'd been... been Working away pretty consistently for quite a long time, reasonably successfully. I was sort of within the industry. I was relatively well established, and then I got Doctor Who, which which is a different level of public recognition. And I was aware that that would happen, 
Um, I mean, I'd done some things where some occasionally somebody would recognise me, but it's but it's it's completely different because Doctor Who is public property and it's loved and it's adored and it has a level of attention focused on it from the press, from the public, from everyone, uh, everywhere. Uh, it's cross generational. It's it's it crosses the the socioeconomic divides. It sort of it gets attention from everywhere in society. Not everyone loves it, but most people know about it. So to suddenly be in the centre of something like that, having never been uh, ubiquitous, it was pretty sudden, and that was that did take a bit of adjusting because you don't get taught how to do that and you don't get taught how it will feel and I remember being aware of it because it, it was the sort of job that you get and there's a few months before it starts and for a long time it's a secret so you don't tell anyone and I remember during that time thinking I was doing a play in Edinburgh and I remember there was a, there was a bit backstage towards the end every night where I used to stand there going this, the next time I do a play it might be different the next sort of life's about to change and some of that's really exciting but you don't know what it's going to be. So you sort of imagine what, what will losing one's anonymity feel like? And I think before you do, and maybe I've got quite a unique experience in some ways because it happened very suddenly. I'd been working as an actor. My job didn't change, but life really did. Um, and, and maybe that gives you a, a certain perspective as to see what that... I, I think from the outside, one imagines that might be quite empowering. That, that sense that, because I've been on the other side of it, when someone walks into a room and everyone notices, there's a sense of, you, well, that must, that you imagine that person must feel very, very powerful, very strong, very confident, very grounded. And then when suddenly you're that person, it's completely the opposite. You not being able to walk into a room anonymously is, it's like your skin's been flayed off. It's, you feel terribly insecure, very vulnerable very visible um, and that happened pretty quickly I was very blessed that I when, when that when, when I was on that very specific start of that journey I was working every day with Billy Piper who is a wonderful human being and who had run the gauntlet of being public property since she was a terrifyingly young age and had been through all manner of pretty rough times coming to terms with that. By the time I got to know Billy, and she was still only 21 or something, yeah. she had lived four of those lives and was a great person to just not dispense advice or anything like that. That's not how Billy would be. But just to sort of hold your hand and just kind of be there and to, and to acknowledge what you were going through and to understand it so you could have a shorthand about when things were difficult and... Uh, what might be a good way into a situation in purely practical terms and in more sort of emotional terms, I suppose. So that was really helpful. Mm. Without Billy there, if I'd been doing it absolutely kind of on my own, I think I'd have struggled even more than I did. Yeah. Um, but it was difficult and it definitely cost me a bit and it, it definitely, I, I had to go and get a bit of help with a bit of it after a while because... It just, I think you just need to understand what that, because you, this is an obvious pat thing to say, but you don't change. No. But How everyone everyone's reacts attitude to you, does. to you does change, and that takes a bit of getting used to. Well, it is, it is still this sort of strange myth, fame, the whole thing, and mm. you see, you see how people react around it, and extremely famous people, it sort of, people lose their minds a bit and don't yeah. quite know how to act yeah. or if they can just be themselves around the famous person or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. inside all of that is just a regular human yeah. with all sorts of thoughts and demons and things going yeah. on in their head. So it is a, a strange thing when you are experiencing that, having witnessed it. Yeah. And we're all... You know, and I was older too. I was yeah, in my, yeah. my mid-30s. Yeah. I mean, fuck knows what that's like if you're 22. I mean, yeah. you were very young. I was. I was very young. And I think I still, you know... I still find it completely absurd and yeah. weird. And, you know, I can go about and not be recognised and it's great. As soon as I open my bloody mouth, it's <laughs> usually yeah. the moment where heads turn and, and like, wait, 
I mean, I know your voice. Like, oh, I should just whispered. But it is, it's a strange thing. And I think there is still this myth because we see it on reality shows constantly that there might be some pot of gold at the end of this fame rainbow where you go, oh, now I feel complete. Now I feel confident. And actually none of that stuff happens. You yeah. just get recognised a lot. Yeah. And depending on your mood that day, it can be pleasant, you can be indifferent about it, or it can feel awful if you're in a bad headspace. So it's, mm. a really, it's a really complex subject. And what I think we don't look at enough because we just go, you know, oh, fame's great. Look at, look at all the people out here who are famous and shiny and how wonderful it all looks. And it's mm. obviously not the case. It's, it's a fascinating subject. When we look at Doctor Who specifically, yeah. you know, that you've told this story on other platforms, I know, that you were a Whovian practically from birth. You yep. know, you love Doctor Who yep. from such a young age. It's your first TV memory yep. is watching Doctor Who. And I've heard people quiz you about this sort of fate and destiny element to things. But I wonder if a lot of it is real knuckle down manifesting. Because you were <laughs> imbibing that show <laughs> and thinking about it with such fondness that you attract and you know you didn't even just attract it in in terms of you became doctor who your father-in-law was doctor who yeah your I wife's know. been in doctor who like yeah. your your life is so doctor who-ish it's outrageous i feel like you've like i used to watch live and kicking and just be like i'm in love with zoe ball i don't know what to do and i watched it unlike other kids i wasn't just going oh this is fun i was studying it you I was yeah. obsessed by it and I think that has helped me bring it into existence in my life yeah how do you feel about manifesting I don't I suppose I'm instinctively skeptical that yeah. it's a thing but I take your point <laughs> in this particular set of circumstances um I don't know I mean I certainly, yes, I was obsessed with Doctor Who. I loved it more than I loved anything else. Uh, and it was a huge influence on me wanting to become an actor. Um, and yes, probably when I was a kid, I thought, yeah, and I, I will one day I'll play that part specifically. That's where I'll end up. That would be great. But then the idea of becoming an actor matured along with me. Then Doctor Who wasn't on the telly anymore, so it wasn't something I was actively thinking about. Um, so then after that, it was, I suppose, a series of unlikely coincidences, which led to... I think there's something... Ab I, I wonder, actually, if there's something about Doctor Who specifically, something about... And this, this is not something I have a, a, a particular answer for, but it's interesting how many people who now work on Doctor Who were Doctor Who fans like me. How many people, it, it, whether it just sets a particular, there's something about the imagination of the idea that sets a particular fire alight in a particular strain of creative people. Because Russell T. Davis is, that's how he grew up, and now he runs a show. Stephen Moffat, who was the other showrunner, Chris Chibnall, who was the third showrunner, they have all, they're, they're all massive, massive Doctor Who fans, probably bigger than me growing up they were all inspired to write by Doctor Who. There's a lot of people who work on the visual effects who were inspired into that side of the industry by Doctor Who. Um, a, a, a large number of actors, and often actors slash writers like Mark Gatiss, massive, massive Doctor I Who. I love fans. him. Yeah. So maybe there's just something about that particular show that means when that generation grew up, they were interested in making either shows like that or indeed in Russell's case, that show. Yeah. Um, and maybe there's something about my acting <laughs> that is inspired by that character. Because I, I, you know, I wanted to be that. There's something that that character is so brilliant. And he's sort of, he's heroic, he's clever, he's funny. He's got all the best lines. He thinks quicker than anyone else. And he's not a jock. And that was something that as a kid meant so much to me because I had... Glasses that were sellotaped up at the leg. I was not sporty. I was not the strong one. I was quite fast. I could run fast. And again, the doctor tends to run fast. Yep. So there were a lot of bits I could get. I could glom onto that character and think, oh, I, I could be the hero of this story, even though there's nothing about me that feels remotely heroic. <laughs> um, but there's something to aspire to in being clever. Brilliant. Uh, not the strongest, not the, the one who can beat people up. Um 
because that was never me. And who's also comes from a place of it's a, it's a sort of rather beautiful character. It comes from a place of understanding mm. and benevolence and pacifism and uh, and and tolerance and all those things, which just seem to make sense. So now the fact that I'm married another doctor's daughter. <laughs> Look, you manifested this shit. I'm sorry, <laughs> you can't get around this one. <laughs> Did. Maybe she just <laughs> understood something about me. <laughs> but I would. But well, I suppose I only met her because I was on Doctor Who, and she got cast on Doctor Who. And, and on some, the, the, she was definitely attractive to the production team because she was the Doctor's daughter, yeah. and she played a character who was the Doctor's, doctor's daughter, daughter, which had yeah. a lovely synergy to it. Um, you know, to find a, a, a brilliant actress who also was that thing. There was a, you know. Uh, she made perfect sense for it. Have you spent a great lengths of time talking to your father-in-law about Doctor Who? It does always come up. Yeah, you can't not really, can it? Because it's one of those, uh, you know, he, he played the part when I was 11. Yeah. Uh, and it's still a huge part of his life. Because, like I was saying earlier, it's one of those shows that just attracts an attention. Because it's beloved and that's lovely. It's so humbling to be in the middle of that. Mm. Sometimes it's overwhelming. but it, but it's But it's mostly a lovely thing to be associated with. I, and it doesn't go away because people won't let it go away. And because you don't want it to, because what a lovely thing to be part of. Oh, it's magic. Yeah. It's so magic. I mean, you everything we've talked about over this length of time, you're juggling alongside five kids. Yes. We had. And <laughs> yes. it was quite funny because when I was doing my research, I listened to Desert Island Discs. I mentioned this to you last yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Kirsty said, and I hadn't looked, checked the year, but Kirsty said, and do you want children? And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. This is when he had no kids. And I, I can't imagine that. You have a house with, I mean, one of them is an adult, but you've got a lot yeah. of people in that house. Yeah. How Do you get overwhelmed? How do you find time? Oh, just, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. I mean, five kids is a lot. Um, And, uh, you know, now the full age range, you know, yeah. 22 all the way down to four. So it's never a quiet house. No. And it's never not busy. There's mm. always someone to be taken somewhere or picked up or dropped off or there's people around or there's... Um, and that can be wonderful and life affirming and joyous and it can be a massive headache as well but they're all great and i i think they're all brilliant and they're all fascinating and when they start being themselves so like, cool. hang on i that's not i have no agency over this thought oh, yeah. you just had what i know isn't that the most crazy moment of yeah. parenthood where you yeah. go Oh, you're a little human being who just turned up like that. Yeah. I thought that I was telling you how to be a human. Yeah, quite. But we're not. And they teach you how they are going to be. I love it. And who they are. And you have to learn to just let them be. All that stuff is a... is a. I mean, it's wonderful. It's a joy. And it's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, I'd love to sleep past 6 a.m. It's never going to happen. I mean, you've got years to Surely till it's going to happen. If, Eventually, doesn't it happen? David, Eventually, no, no, because of We've course we still got two that are waking up at six a.m. every day. Yeah, of course you have, and then by the time they're not, the older two will be coming in at three in the morning and waking oh, you up. So dear. we're screwed forever. You yeah. have to accept this now. Yeah, that I we know. are screwed for life. People keep saying it must be great because they must start to babysit each other, and you went, I wish that. No, happens. no, no. I don't feel like that's happening at all. No, 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 no. That's a pipe dream, yeah. I'm afraid. <laughs> it's, it's not a the, thing. Turns out, they're my responsibility. <laughs> exactly, yeah. We have to deal with the hard work. No, yeah. it's, it's a mad juggle. It's a mad juggle, but it's a beautiful juggle, and I think it helps each part of life, work versus the kids, balances yeah. the other out. And yeah. It, it's mental. It does, yeah. But it it helps both sides and uh, and overbalances the the other as well. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. There sometimes when it works, it's wonderful. But it it, it also means the juggling is never easy. Never, you easy. never feel like you've got it right. No. Um and yeah, the, the it, it's it's a sort of constant churn as well as a constant delight. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, we were talking last week to sort of break the fourth wall here in podcast yeah. land we were talking about what to talk about today yes and it's almost well, this is getting harder. very meta yeah so meta my head's gonna explode yeah. but it's almost harder to interview someone when you know them yeah because 
there's almost sort of the lines are more blurry and the boundaries aren't but in we place. Know, we, we, it, it may be worth pointing out, we yes. know each other sort of Through domestically, don't we? Yes. Rather than professionally. <laughs> Not work-wise, no. no. We've worked together once. We did the what, Children in Need thing Children once, in Need we? thing. Yeah. But our kids are mates. I think I was on your radio show once. And you've been on my radio show yeah. years ago, yes. A million absolutely. years ago. A million ago. years ago, yeah. yeah. But actually, we, we... We only know each other. From, like, school runs. And <laughs> yeah. Like, picking kids up from houses. Yeah, and exactly. Like, in a lovely... And, like, here's my tortoise in the garden. This sort, this <laughs> yeah. sort of thing. So it's almost a stranger place. And I've had other people that I know on the podcast, yeah. but I wanted to sort of get clear on the boundaries. If I I'm know. Get technical and go right. Well, what are you comfy with and what are you not comfy with? And one thing that I put up for grabs is: Do we talk about you being um, part of the LGBTQ plus community alle- allegiance, like being an ally, being mm. a supportive person for that community? And that is something where, you know, maybe a subject where you were like, I don't know. I'm not sure if I yeah. want to talk about it or not. Because, of course, being a person in the public eye, anything you talk about or vehemently support will then be scrutinised mm. and dissected. And that is tricky, especially when it's something that you really passionately believe in. It's a tricky one. It is really tricky because I, what I'm very aware of, I don't enjoy being controversial. I don't enjoy that feeling of of uh, being in the centre of anything that feels antagonistic or difficult. And yet sometimes, well, the, the bar for controversialness is so low these yeah. days because everything is so polarised. And and, I, I, and sometimes it feels like stating the bleeding obvious, it, it somehow it can be disagreed with. <laughs> That's what I find very difficult not to get into controversial waters when I feel like I'm just saying, well, obviously we, everyone has the right to express who they are. I, I get very angry that people su- su- should suggest otherwise. But I'm conf- I'm always conflicted because I, as an actor, it's not really my job. If I really want to get political, I should run for parliament and I'm not about to do that. If I, you know, if I really want to change the world, I could probably go off and do something about it and uh, you know I pull faces for a living and that's I, I, I'm not planning on changing that anytime soon but um, there is power in having a public platform yeah. which I guess is the conflict because you can shift the dial hmm. by just being you I, I, it, it, so it would seem <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and and you know there are some times where you're going to think well I'm I am going to say that because because yeah, you you are afforded a louder voice just because people know who you are, and but I I do always I, I'm always cagey about overusing that voice or or venturing into areas where how am I trying to put this? I don't want to start telling people how to think with, if, unless I'm because I could do something else. Does that make sense? I could run for parliament. I could, I, you know, you don't need to listen to me because I'm an actor, because you liked me in a show, doesn't doesn't give me the right to tell you how to think. But, but knowing sometimes... That, knowing your voice <laughs> helps a community that well, is often struggling... Certainly in the term... It's a beautiful yeah, thing. Certainly in terms of anything I say in support of the LGBTQ community just it, t- it just feels like common sense to me and i find it ludicrous how some of the those conversations have been weaponized and turned into an element of the culture wars especially when i see people doing it for what appear to me to be disingenuous reasons um especially when it's weaponized politically to make an already marginalised group more marginalised for the sake of someone's poll numbers I think is disgusting and I think that needs to be countered um, you know and as as long as you're not hurting anybody else why should anyone else have a say of how how you live your life yeah I don't get it I get that it's, I, I, I sense that conflict inside because you want to support and you want to be there and you and you obviously want to, well, we all do, we want to see 
a lovely equal society where everyone's yeah. safe and feels accepted. Yeah. But you can't step into that arena without fear because, as you've said, you know, the landscape at the moment for saying anything mm. is really treacherous. Yeah. So you know you're possibly walking into potential stress for yourself. Yeah. So yeah. you put yourself on the line to do so. Yeah. I think, though, especially when people are punching down, you just think, well, it's not going to cost me. I'll be OK. I'm a sort of white, middle-aged pretty privileged bloke who doesn't have to run some quite scary gamuts here so uh, I think there are times when it's just you just have to say something yeah yeah without a doubt without a doubt well look it's been an absolute joy to talk to you today David well it's been fun to be in this uh, this, this particular dynamic for a change I know so we're not talking about school assemblies we haven't mentioned or... an assembly or any homework it's outrageous or anything oh, any event we're supposed to be attending that we've forgotten about oh I, I can't it's making me bring out entire <laughs> thinking about it god almighty um, no it's been so brilliant and as I said I can't wait to see episode two of The Rivals it's going to just bring me so much joy and escapism. Yeah. I'm here for it. I think it is quite a joyous show. It is. Uh, yeah. Very. Which is interesting because none of the characters are very joyous. <laughs> it's <laughs> just the best. They're full of misery and torture. and. Uh... But then we can look at other people's misery and feel good about ourselves. <laughs> yeah. And that's why we like it. Yeah. So well done on the rivals. Well, thank it's you bloody brilliant. Thank you very much. And thank you, David Tennant. Thank you, Farron. Mm-hmm.